100 years separates their reigns. Different eras, different societies, almost different worlds. Two women, Elizabeth and Victoria. Two queens who have steered their course through periods of extraordinary change. In the British monarchy's 1,000-year history, their like has rarely been seen. Their longevity is unrivaled. On the 9th of September, Queen Elizabeth II will become the longest reigning monarch in British history. She will break the record set by her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who was on the throne for 63 years and seven months. Yet they became monarchs unexpectedly at a young age. Neither Queen Victoria nor Queen Elizabeth were born to be queen, and indeed, uh, there was no great expectation that either of them would be. I think certainly we'll look back and say there's been the biggest change in society under these two female monarchs. I think history will look back on them both and compare them because it's really so incredibly unique. And both of them symbolize their country, and that's what's so wonderful about monarchy. It is a symbol above politics. But what does it take to be a monarch who defines an era? One who has the power to capture the hearts and minds of people at home and abroad. She's just brilliant. At her age, to be still doing things like this, it is just fantastic. I never really got this whole queen thing, to be honest. I really didn't. Um, but I've got it now, and I just... OK, sorry, I posted on Facebook that I've fallen <laughs> in love with the queen. <laughs> As the Queen reaches this milestone, we look at the long reigns of two extraordinary women and ask how they've managed to provide such enduring stability in an ever-changing world. It's March 2015 at Canterbury Cathedral. And here she is, Elizabeth II, the face of the modern monarchy. She's here to unveil statues of herself and her husband, Prince Philip. Immortalized in stone next to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, in this, the year Elizabeth becomes the longest reigning monarch Nobody expected that. On April the 21st, 1926, a child was born to the Duke and Duchess of York, Elizabeth and Prince Albert, who was the second son of King George V. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary came into this world a princess. Her popular uncle, the Prince of Wales, was next in line to the throne, followed by her father. So no one ever expected that one day Elizabeth would become queen. And she certainly wasn't born in a palace. In fact, she was born right here. On Bruton Street in Mayfair, now a restaurant. A plaque is the only reminder that before the bombings of World War II, Elizabeth's home stood on this site. And here they are, the family at their home in 1927, and nanny and baby Elizabeth. The young princess was expected to lead a relatively quiet life away from the full glare of the monarchy, which is just what people thought at the birth of another royal infant. Victoria was born in a palace, Kensington Palace, on May the 24th, 1819. At birth, she was fifth in line to the throne. And even though her mother was fiercely ambitious, no one could have known that Victoria was destined to become queen. She too was raised quietly, away from court, under the care of her strong-willed German mother, Victoria Maria Luisa, the Duchess of Kent. Here she is, Here she is Victoria. Victoria herself. Victoria spent her childhood here in Kensington, and she said herself, I had a very unhappy childhood. And she was also a long way from the throne. No one thought she'd ever come anywhere near it. Basically, when she was born, she was intended to be married into other royal families, a very minor royal. So no one thought anything much of it. 
By her own account, Victoria was brought up very simply here in a suite of rooms on the first floor of Kensington Palace. It was a privileged but isolated existence. What we do know is that she remembered later on this terrible, oppressive, melancholy childhood. We think it was a little bit more complex than that. In what way? Well, she was lonely, but she was also very imaginative. She had 132 dolls, and they're all very neatly and in a very organized way listed in her inventory, which she kept at the time. She must have had a sort of very, you know, big, a dream world, the way she played with these dolls. I suppose she had a lack of friends. We wonder whether some of the costumes could possibly be made from fabrics that made Princess Victoria's dresses. <laughs> That's not something we're able to prove, but it's a possibility. Before she was one, her grandfather and father died. And when her uncle George IV passed away, another uncle became king, which meant she was next in line to the throne at the age of 11. Life became even more restrictive. Her mother kept her under well, really, pretty much lock and key. They called it the Kensington system. They wanted control of her, so they kept her under 24-hour surveillance. She wasn't allowed to have a single minute alone because what they wanted was her to come to the throne at, say, 10, 12, and they be the one in the power. They be the one being regent. She was sheltered and protected, and she even shared a bedroom with her mother until the day she became queen at the age of 18. In stark contrast, Elizabeth's early life was happy and carefree. She had the constant companionship of her younger sister, Princess Margaret. Princess Margaret. We four. They had the common touch. They had ordinary Scottish nannies. Scottish nannies looking up. Um, Boba MacDonald taught her how to iron the wrapping paper of her presents and put it away in a drawer so that um, she could reuse it. But she went on the bus, she went to the museums, and all the time, in those early years, she was just being prepared for the life of a, of, of, of a young lady of the middle to upper classes. But all that changed suddenly in 1936. It was the year of the three kings. In January, King George V, Elizabeth's grandfather, died. Her uncle took the throne as King Edward VIII, but his reign lasted just 325 days. He abdicated in order to marry the twice-divorced American Wallace Simpson. By December that year, Elizabeth's father was king. Elizabeth moved here to Buckingham Palace with her family at the age of just 10. Her father was now king, and it must have been a huge change for the young princess, who until then had been raised in a more modest family home, albeit in Mayfair. It was 1937, exactly 100 years after Queen Victoria had arrived here at the age of 18. Victoria left Kensington Palace just weeks after becoming queen. Her first requests were for time alone at last away from her mother and a bedroom of her own. She got much more than that. Victoria became the first monarch to make Buckingham Palace her official residence. Over the years, she transformed the place and visitors to this day are still met by the paintings of her nearest and dearest. How much did Queen Victoria changed Buckingham Palace, and why? Well, I think she wanted to make it a, a centre of, of, of court life, and court life, I think, of a very different sort. I mean, the thing about the monarchy in the middle of the Victorian period was that it became respectable for the first time. And really, this was a palace which was going to house a court which was the epitome of the kind of new morality of the family and of society. Elizabeth has transformed this palace in another way. 
In 1962, she opened the Queen's Gallery to give the paying public access to the Royal Art Collection. In 1993, she opened the doors even wider. Tens of thousands now take the chance to wander through the state rooms, with ticket and gift shop sales going towards the upkeep of the artworks. Guests are invited to a reception at Buckingham Palace for the Queen's Award for Enterprise, now in its 50th year and each guest is greeted personally. It means a huge amount to these businesses. You could be in China, you could be in India and Brazil, people will see the emblem of these awards and they will know that you've got that because you're a very successful British business and it actually then leads to more business, which is great news for Britain. Such a boost to me personally, to my confidence uh, as a businesswoman, but obviously to the business. I've met so many fantastic other businesses, so I look forward to a lot more business networking as well. The questions she was asking tonight were quite interesting. They were very business orientated, and she obviously knows what's going on, which is which is great. You know, the Queen herself is such an inspiration for all yes. of us, and, and so for it's, women in general. Yeah. I think you know, I mean, an inspiration of. Hard work, dedication, you know, it, it, uh, like what entrepreneurs should look up to. Buckingham Palace, it's such an iconic building, it's hard to imagine that it hasn't always looked like this. But Queen Victoria wanted to extend the palace, and so she sold Brighton Pavilion to pay for it, and added on this whole frontage, everything you can see now, including, of course, one of the most famous balconies in the world. Here's Victoria in 1893, first photographed on the balcony and Elizabeth, her great-great-granddaughter, making her debut as a baby. Across time, the balcony became a sort of rallying point for the nation. No more so than in May 1945, when war in... ...as Elizabeth stood proudly by him in her uniform. Growing up during World War II shaped the future queen. In 1940, she was the teenager who gave this radio broadcast for children forced to evacuate their homes. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. You would have thought that the royal family would have been moved a long way away to safety, but instead the princesses came here. They lived here in Windsor Castle for much of the war, and the castle was stripped of all its finery. The paintings were removed and hidden in caves in Wales and other places. And it was a very much diminished castle, except for the magnificence of the buildings. There was a big air raid shelter built under one of the towers, which no one liked using, but they did when the air raid sirens sounded. As the bombing raids of the Blitz hit, it was suggested that the princesses should be evacuated, to which the Queen Mother had an immediate reply. She said, the children would never leave without me. I would never leave without the King, and the King will never leave. Indeed, in September 1940, the King and Queen were very nearly killed when a German bomber flew up the Mall and dropped its bombs directly on Buckingham Palace. They concealed how nearly they came to death. They realized instantly that they had to be the focal point of the nation at war. And that was, was transferred to Princess Elizabeth. And we have seen that ever since, duty is what has defined her and led her and inspired her. Elizabeth, unlike Victoria, was able to learn the art of being a monarch from her parents. But both entered public life in the same way and in the same place, each showing their commitment to the armed forces. Queen Victoria came here 
here to Windsor Castle to review her troops for the first time when she was just 18. A century later, Elizabeth, then still a princess, followed in her footsteps on her 16th birthday. It was her first official engagement. The British Grenadiers then marched past Her Royal Highness the Kirk. She's back. It's April 2015. Now 89, the Queen is presenting new colours to the 1st Battalion, the Welsh Guards. She knows the military inside out and played her part in the war effort when she joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service at the age of 18. One of the things she did was to learn how to strip down a truck. And there are famous pictures of her doing so. And she worked with other people who had been called up who were serving from all walks of life. And I think that was her first proper introduction to life outside of the family. And these were all sort of incremental steps in her training, if you like, uh, towards being the monarch. Her uh, Majesty the Queen knows absolutely everything that's happening in the ceremonial state occasion but she knows that I'm there to just make sure those people that don't know are led and guided um, so that they can give the best performance. I'm inspired by a, an absolutely wonderful lady. I mean, the Queen is what we fight for and fight under for the country, and she's sort of the head of the army and, and our, our regiment, so uh, it's extremely special for the boys. Do you think that the Queen really does understand what you do, what you go through? hundred percent, a hundred percent. She, I think she probably knows more than anyone in her time of understanding what sacrifice for a country is. Um, and she's an extremely, extremely special person. Recognition from the monarch has always been highly prized. At the end of the Crimean War in 1856, Queen Victoria introduced the Victoria Cross for bravery. A medal has been created in Elizabeth's name too, the Elizabeth Cross, for the next of kin of British servicemen and women killed on military operations or by terrorism. Two recent tours of Afghanistan have seen the Welsh Guards lose Afghanistan have seen the Welsh Guards lose nine men. Lieutenant Mark Everson was one of them. You have been awarded the Elizabeth Cross. Yeah in memory of your son. Yes. Just explain what the Elizabeth Cross is and how important it is to you. Most awards that are given are given to soldiers, but this is something for the families, which is actually saying, you know, the families are involved in this as, as well. However prepared one is for um, soldier death, it leaves a huge hole in, in families. This memory, this little cross signifies that, really. Elizabeth is the daughter, mother and wife of military men. By her side today, as he has been for every step of her reign, is Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. They got to know one another in 1939 as Elizabeth accompanied her parents on an official visit to the Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. The cadet assigned to show her around was Philip, a prince by birth of Greece and Denmark, also a great-great-grandchild of Victoria's. The Queen saw him, this handsome young Viking, uh, with his sense of humour. Uh, I think she, right at the start, his lack of reverence um, his sense of informality appealed to her, as well as his stunning good looks. They became pen pals, with Elizabeth keeping a photo of a bearded Philip as he fought for his adopted country, Britain. It was a love match. And in 1946, after a, a holiday at Balmoral, they got engaged, and uh, though secretly, um, because the King and Queen asked them to postpone the public announcement until the following year. The royal family and Princess Elizabeth's fiancé have permitted these special film studies to be made in response to the rapidly mounting worldwide interest in the forthcoming royal wedding on the 20th of November in Westminster Abbey. I am Alexander Mary. Take thee, Philip. 
To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. They wed when Elizabeth was 21. And that of any other British sovereign. It's a cornerstone of Elizabeth's reign. As she's said in several tributes to him, he is the rock on which her work as a monarch has been based. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. Queen Victoria had her rock too. For Victoria and now Elizabeth, a vital thread through their lives has been the love and support of their husbands. Both married European princes, both met their husbands-to-be when they were very young and then got to know them slowly through letters. He also looked like a film star. I mean, there's something very romantic in the fact that both Prince Albert and Prince Philip uh, were both uh, sort of gorgeous to look at, you know, that, that builds up the whole fairy tale. Victoria was 16 when she met Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Goethe. He was her first cousin from Germany. It was determined, more or less, from childhood onwards, that Victoria would marry one of those Coburg children. There were some other candidates for her to marry, but that was the obvious one. And it was her great luck that she fell in love with him, besottedly. Um, it was a real love affair and love match from the beginning. They kept in touch by letters, and she described him as so sensible, so kind and so good, and so amiable too. She really hadn't had a chance to have anyone to love. She and her mother had been at loggerheads. She had no sister, no friend, no father. So she'd been a very lonely child, and all this passion had really pent up inside her. Obviously, Victoria's wedding to Albert um, on a grisly February day is essentially a private um, service. Um, Victoria herself said that she noted every detail. Indeed, she does appear to have noted every detail in her journal afterwards. I think for Victoria, it was a wonderful day in every way. The couple were married in 1840. Victoria was already queen, so she had to propose to him. They went on to have nine children. Albert brought an experience of the world Victoria had never known. He developed a strong interest in arts and culture and built the Italian gardens in Kensington as a testimony of his love for her. She rejoiced in her marriage to Albert and it had for her a significance only rivaled by her coronation day. Victoria's coronation came after the death of her uncle, William IV. It's one of the quirks of the hereditary system that one is expected both to mourn and rejoice at the same time, mourn the death of one sovereign, rejoice in the accession of the next. I think in 1837 there is a definite imbalance. There is notably more rejoicing than mourning. She loves being queen at the age of 18. She tells the wife of a courtier that she woke up one morning afraid it might all turn out to be a dream. She thoroughly enjoys the dream. 400,000 people flocked to London for her coronation, helped by the transport revolution, the railways, and the hopes of a nation resting on youthful shoulders, something shared by only two women in more than 100 years. Elizabeth's path to accession came in 1952. In January, she and Philip were waved off at the airport by her father, King George VI, as they began a Commonwealth tour in his name. It was the last time they would see one another. He was only 56. On February the 6th, 4,000 miles away from London, Princess Elizabeth was brought the news the world was soon to hear. It was announced from Sandringham at 10.45 today that the king, who retired to rest last night in his usual health, passed peacefully away in his sleep earlier this morning. People were shocked by the death of the king. It wasn't anticipated, except in the inner circle who knew just how ill he was. 
Elizabeth returned to London in mourning, a young woman who now held the future of the monarchy in her hands. For four days, King George VI lay in state in Westminster. I remember walking past the catafalque of King George VI. My mother took me and my brother Rory, and I was only three, and we queued for hours. You can't imagine that now, can you? Queuing for hours outside Westminster Hall, but she said, she said, you will remember you will remember this all your life, and this is something we owe him. The nation mourned for the man who had saved the British monarchy. He passed on the essential value of duty to his daughter, something his great-grandmother, Victoria, understood well herself. In 1838, Queen Victoria, at the age of 19, came here to Westminster Abbey for her coronation. Just over a century later, her great-great-granddaughter Elizabeth followed in her footsteps and was crowned right here in the very same place. More than 8,000 people packed the abbey that day and millions were watching on the television around the world. Elizabeth was 27 years old and the mother of two young children. Children. How was Elizabeth received at the coronation? We all became romantics on a huge collective scale. And of course, the setting in this abbey, where the very stones talk, with the old statesman in marble looking down on it, Israeli Gladstone Peel. We were right in the middle of this wonderful combination which the Brits pride themselves on, or did, of juxtaposing tradition and modernity and making the two work together. But above all, the young woman sitting just over there. seared across the Velcro of memory, and it's a very dazzling searing, because post-war London was very drab. We'd lost a third of our wealth in the war. There was still rationing. Very few people had any new clothes. And yet suddenly, in amidst this heroic drabness, there was the starburst of the coronation of the new beautiful young queen. I remember it, I was on Victoria Embankment, and it was a kind of magic moment when the great golden coach went by, and then this smiling figure, it was one of the moments of the reawakening of the country uh, after a long and tense and deprived period. And for those who weren't there, thanks to the revolution of television, the nation could watch from their living rooms. 27 million people in Britain in June 1953 watch at least half a day's television coverage. The number of BBC licence holders doubles that day. So there is this sense of what newspapers refer to as coronation fever. We've only known in recent years that it was in fact the Queen who said, yes, it ought to be televised. An acknowledgement that the, uh, uh, the monarchy, as it were, belongs to the people you've got to with the, the new means of communication. And then this smiling figure, just all the diamonds reflecting and, uh, with the Duke of Edinburgh. But I mean, I remember it so absolutely vividly. Five months after her coronation, Elizabeth returned to the Commonwealth tour she'd begun before her father's death. Now she was queen and also head of the Commonwealth of Nations, which from small beginnings has expanded during her reign to take in 53 countries. She has visited almost all of them. I think historians will look back on the reign and achievements of Elizabeth II and pick out the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is a real family, so successful that countries that are not former British colonies have asked to join and been allowed to join. For Victoria, she was Empress of India with the reach of a global superpower, the British Empire. Not that she saw much of it. Britain did rule half the world 
and it stretched everywhere from Canada to Australia and included great tracts of Asia and Africa. And it's true that Queen Victoria didn't visit any of these places. She was very much in touch and thinking about them a lot. She became besotted with India and Indian culture in her later years. She taught herself Hindustani, uh, and she could speak a little bit of Urdu. She would have loved to go to India, but they didn't let her. So in her mind and her spirit, she traveled, completely unlike um, Queen Elizabeth, who actually travels. Queen Elizabeth II has crisscrossed the globe for more than 60 years. Here and abroad, she has shaken the hands of history. It's June 2015, and once again, the red carpet is laid out on foreign soil. This is Berlin's take. This is. but that will not phase the most well-traveled monarch in history. The Queen first came to Germany on a state visit in 1965. It was a country still divided by Cold War communism. Her visit was a gesture of solidarity and a step towards normalizing relations with Germany in the decades after World War II. People still... People still... For my husband and me, it is a deeply moving experience to be with you here in this courageous and famous city. Fifty years on, Germany, now a unified country, has changed dramatically. The welcome for the Queen hasn't. Wherever the Queen goes, she brings with her a sense of occasion. And there's been real excitement here in Germany in the run-up to this visit. She's on every front page today, and the papers are full of what to do, what to wear if you meet her. And German television has been running British-themed programmes. And that's the thing about the Queen. Wherever she goes, she brings with her an indefinable something that no one else can. 
Queen is our big differentiator in the eyes of many of our foreign partners and friends. They deal with other governments, they deal with other heads of state, uh, but the Queen is something completely unique. And you see that in the reaction of the crowds lining the streets. Two of the most powerful women in the world, one a monarch, the other the German Chancellor, who has been dubbed the Queen of Europe. And not the German Chancellor, who has been dubbed the Queen of Europe. And given the question mark over the future of Britain in the EU, the timing of this state visit is being seen as something of a diplomatic coup. for many people for many different reasons um, uh, this is a very important uh, visit a very important moment and it brings Britain and Germany closer together at a time which is for us actually very important for there to be good and close relationships as a constitutional monarch the Queen must remain politically neutral hers is more of a personal power Arriving at the state banquet, she is wearing Queen Victoria's rubies as she delivers words echoing a lifetime of experience. We know the division in Europe is dangerous and that we must guard against it in the West as well as in the East of our continent. That remains a common endeavour. Flying the flag for the United Kingdom at the British ambassador's residence in Berlin. Every year, a garden party is held to honour the Queen. But this is the first time she and the Duke of Edinburgh have actually been able to attend. The interest in Germany in the Queen is already big. People have been thinking about the institution of the monarchy and about the overall relationship between Germany and the United Kingdom. Um, in diplomatic speak, we call it soft power. It's what the Queen stands for. It's the, the values that she embodies. Uh, and that has deep impact. There's all those disputes we do have at the moment in Europe about Britain and Europe and the rest of the world. So it's important that we do have this unifying personality. She's there and she stands for something and a value that is not changing. And uh, so it's like an authority. You know, all the emotions here at this garden party that show that there's a very strong belief in Germany that um, please uh, stay in the EU, uh, we need you. Very smiley never, and talkative, actually. Yeah, and I never really got this whole Queen thing, to be honest. I really didn't. Um, but I've got it now. And I just, okay, sorry, I posted on Facebook that I've fallen <laughs> in love with the Queen. <laughs> In Germany's modern democracy, sections of the wall which once separated East from West in the Cold War now stand only as symbolic fragments. And this is a country which remembers its deeper past, those who were killed in one of the most dreadful persecutions in history. Seventy years ago, British forces liberated this camp and they discovered, much to their horror, that on this very soil, tens of thousands of people had died in a most horrific fashion. It was liberated by World War II Allied troops in April 1945. Seventy years later, it is the Queen's request that she and the Duke of Edinburgh end their German state visit by paying their respects at the site of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And for some, the memories are very personal. To me, it was just a, one huge horror story. How any human beings could treat other human beings in this way, just incredible. I don't think there was a sort of screaming of joy because everybody thought we must be dreaming. We hear an English voice, what, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't what we were preparing us for. We were preparing us to die.
her visit shows that she takes human suffering seriously. She identifies with the pain and deep suffering of the Jewish people. And together with so many other people, she's absolutely determined to guarantee that the horrors that took place here in Belsen will never happen anywhere else again. In Britain, religion and the monarchy are forever intertwined. Since King Henry VIII famously separated the English church from Rome, every monarch has become defender of the faith and head of the Church of England. Victoria, she was devout, outspoken on church matters. She even wrote about her views on sermons in her diaries. I think that sincerity of faith is something that Queen Victoria shares with Elizabeth II. I feel absolutely sure that both women, in what is unquestionably a very lonely position, have felt upheld um, at moments, many moments possibly in their reign, by a very strong Christian faith. Many have found the practice of quiet personal reflection surprisingly rewarding, even discovering greater spiritual depth to their lives. In her Christmas broadcasts, she talks often about how the teachings of Christ are what inform and inspire her. The feet very firmly on the ground, but spiritually, she's got this dimension in which her personal faith is linked to her duty as a monarch. And each monarch also has formal duties in relation to the government of the day. It was during Victoria's reign that political power moved away from the sovereign, but she still kept a keen interest in the details of political life, as does Queen Elizabeth, who at the start of her reign decided to change the monarch's regular meetings with the Prime Minister into a weekly affair, the audience. When Parliament sits, the Prime Minister arrives for their regular meeting, where the Queen has what's been described as the right to be consulted, to be consulted, to the course of 12 British Prime Ministers. Her first PM was Winston Churchill, who'd known Elizabeth since she was a child and was the only elected member of parliament under both Victoria and Elizabeth. Well, Churchill was in love with her. There's no other way of putting it. His, one of a member of his private office said that he was dotty about her and felt very protective of her and wanted to ease her into the duties of monarchy. And she receives the red boxes daily, containing cabinet and foreign and commonwealth papers. She's been terribly well informed. When you think about it, the first weekly intelligence summary she got from the Joint Intelligence Committee in February 1952 would have had at least a section on it, I'm sure, of Stalin's capabilities and military intentions. Can you imagine it? The long reigns of Elizabeth and Victoria mean they have had to steer their way through periods of extraordinary change. Queen Victoria's reign saw the Industrial Revolution, economic progress and the growth of the British Empire. Scores of grand buildings went up during the Victorian age, many of which are still with us today, like this one, the Victoria and Albert Museum. It houses one of the largest collections of decorative art and design in the world. So what is Victoria and Albert's legacy in terms of art and culture? It's fundamental. I mean, this museum, as you know, is the Victoria and Albert Museum, and that name is not an accident. It was renamed the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1899, and it was one of Queen Victoria's last public appearances when she came to lay the foundation stone of the front of our museum. How big a role did Victoria and Albert have in, in bringing the arts to the people? Throughout her life, and indeed throughout Albert's life, they were actively promoting education and culture, 
art and science. This whole complex at South Kensington is thanks to the way they supported and promoted these, these activities. So much so that this area became known as Albertopolis, also taking in the Albert Memorial, Victoria's vast tribute to the man she adored, who died at the age of 42. The great expansion seen in the Victorian age has not been repeated during Elizabeth's reign. Instead, there have been huge leaps in science, technology, medicine, even space travel, and far greater freedom and tolerance. In an age of rapid innovation and cultural change, the Queen recognizes pioneers from every field. At Windsor Castle, she has a gathering of the holders of the Order of Merit. It's a celebration of the elite from music, art, medicine, astronomy, architecture, theater. Queen Victoria may have been the first monarch to try the telephone with none other than the inventor Alexander Graham Bell. But it was Elizabeth who in 1958 made the first direct dialed long distance telephone call. This is the Queen speaking from Bristol. Good afternoon, Lord Provost. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. She was the first British monarch to send an email in 1976 and has a Twitter, Facebook, YouTube and Flickr account in her name. In the monarchy's one in the monarchy's 1000 year history, only two British sovereigns have marked their silver, golden and diamond jubilees. Victoria and Elizabeth. To mark her 60 years on the throne, Elizabeth chose to be photographed in front of the Queen Victoria Memorial with the diamonds worn by Victoria more than a century earlier. And if a Jubilee celebration is a test of popularity, it's one the Queen easily passed. Hundreds of thousands turned out to celebrate. Her speech that year seemed to recognize her unique place in the world. I have been privileged to witness some of that history and with the support of my family, rededicate myself to the service of our great country and its people now and in the years to come. And then that same year, for the London Olympics, the Queen was cast...
Long rain can bring challenges. Unlike Elizabeth, Victoria had to spend almost four decades without her beloved husband by her side. Queen Victoria did flack after the death of Prince Albert, not for the rest of her reign, as some people mistakenly think. It was really for about 10 years that she was much more in retirement, and she worked all the way through it. I mean, there's a fantasy that she was just lying. Years. The politicians constantly feared, because she was so reclusive and shy and didn't like waving from balconies and didn't wear crowns, um, that somehow or another she was out of touch. And in a very mysterious way, she wasn't. In June 1897, Queen Victoria was persuaded to make an effort for her Diamond Jubilee. She was captured in this rare footage and she had an empire to call upon. London had never seen anything like it. Um, the Bengal lancers, people from all over the world, African warriors, parading through the streets with all their wonderful costumes and uniform. It was partly a demonstration of this extraordinary political stability, that this institution, which had been so fragile in 1837, was now going stronger than ever in 1897, thanks to this very eccentric clever but strange woman sitting in an open uh, carriage riding through the streets of London in a black bonnet. The whole place was alive with excitement. Both Victoria and then Elizabeth came here to St Paul's Cathedral to mark their diamond jubilees. For Victoria, who by then was 78, it was a rare public appearance. She was still mourning Albert decades after his death. And she was frail too, too frail to climb these stairs and go inside. So instead, when her carriage drew up here in front of jubilant crowds, she remained in it and the whole service came out to her. But we do know what Queen Victoria thought about her Diamond Jubilee. She wrote about it in her journals. And just a few years ago, Queen Elizabeth had them all put online. Victoria wrote, a never to be forgotten day. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given to me, passing through those six miles of streets, including Constitution Hill. The crowds were quite indescribable and their enthusiasm truly marvelous and deeply touching. The cheering was quite deafening and every face seemed to be filled with real joy. I was much moved and gratified. As well as being visible, the monarch must connect with every part of the United Kingdom. Ah! Ah! Today, the Queen, a direct descendant of Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, arrives in Edinburgh for Holyrood Week. It starts with the ancient ceremony of the keys, unchanged since Victoria's time. Well, it's a very significant uh, process because it's the well, it's a very significant uh, process because it's the presentation of the city's keys uh, to the monarch. Uh, but also, you know, for people of the city, it's a meaningful event because it's about the Queen's authority in the city. It's also about a welcome for garden party guests in the spectacular grounds of the palace. Royal garden parties were introduced by Victoria at Buckingham Palace in the 1860s and brought here to Scotland by Elizabeth's grandfather, George V. This is the Queen attending as a child. 8,000 people have been invited to this and heritage. At her age, to be still doing things like this, it is just fantastic. I think today has been a very good example of exactly what we as a country do well, and I think she's at the very heart of it. And the fact she visits the, our, our islands, you know, she, she embraces out all the parts of Scotland that we love. Her and the Duke have done a marvellous job over the years, and I hope they'll have many more.
what over the six decades of her reign has been done is, is the knitting together, I think, of an extraordinarily ever richer tapestry of Scottish life. Uh, my lot, a part of the older threads, but every year through this great gathering, new, fresh threads are added. The Queen has deep personal connections to Scotland. Her mother grew up here. Her sister, Princess Margaret, was born here. In fact, she was the first royal baby to be born in Scotland for more than 300 years. And since she was a child, Scotland is where the Queen has always come on her family holidays. During late summer and autumn, the Queen still enjoys her longest spell of privacy in the place she's visited since childhood. It's a tradition started by Victoria, who in her 20s was only the second reigning British monarch to venture north of the border since the days of Charles I. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert fell in love with Scotland. Prince Albert saw Germany in it. He was reminded of Germany, the sort of forests of firs and all that kind. Queen Victoria was privy to a kind of ordinary life up there that was more difficult in Windsor or in London. Victoria did deer stalking and uh, watercolours and long walks in the heather and getting rained upon and all that. I think there's something about its sort of vastness when you get up into the highlands and that sense of being far away in this kind of um, mountain kingdom. Victoria and Albert bought land here, which they developed, building the magnificent Balmoral Castle. Balmoral was very carefully chosen up on a bluff with the forest quite far back and the water very much below and so on. And it became their own place. You know, it wasn't a house of the British monarchy. It was the house of Victoria and Albert. Uh, and that meant a great deal to her. The home lovingly designed by Albert for Victoria now belongs to Elizabeth. A private residence, but no longer just a royal idyll. For 18 weeks of the year, it's open to the paying public. As she grew older, Victoria spent much of her life at Balmoral. She was here on Wednesday, the 23rd of September, 1896, the day she overtook her grandfather, King George III's record. She wrote, today is the day on which I have reigned longer by a day than any English sovereign. Just days after Victoria had become the longest reigning monarch, she was pictured right here beneath the terrace at Balmoral. It was a very special moment, and that's because it was the first time that Victoria had ever been captured on film. Here she is, surrounded by dogs, children and grandchildren. Victoria, a focus of national unity, who chose to mark her momentous day quietly. Elizabeth will also be in Scotland, but will carry out some official engagements. This is where Queen Victoria was on the day that she became the longest reigning monarch in British history. And this is also where her great-great-granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth, will be when she passes that record on the evening of Wednesday, September the 9th. She will have been on the throne for 23,226 days. There'll be no fuss, no grand celebration. It's business as usual, we're told. But all the same, it is a remarkable achievement and something none of us will ever again see in our lifetime. Even for those that don't think about the monarchy or don't follow it particularly, the fact that she is there and it's there as an institution, and she never puts a foot wrong. I don't think we should uh, withhold our gratitude to both women for keeping this institution, which I think many people cherish in spite of all the jokes we made about it. By being inscrutable, 
untouchable, unfashionable, and unfaddish, the Queen remains a concept that all people potentially can connect with. And I think that's a very important and valuable aspect of our national life. And she simply is always out there meeting people, speaking to people, and very much identifying herself with the whole population, not just one certain group of it. Politicians come and go when they talk about the big society. The Queen and the royal family have practiced it and continue to practice it in all sorts of ways. And that stems totally from the sense of duty and religious um, convictions of Elizabeth II. This is a great country, and one of the reasons it's great is because we have had this continuity of kings and queens for so many centuries. And this queen is probably going to be seen as one of the greatest of all. I think what she has done is she has made us all believe again in the viability of the institution she represents. And to me, that's a great achievement. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it.